up. And it's my great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Spencer Fong, who is a group CEO of Lee and Fong. This is a 112-year-old company that's been in the business of global trade for, for a long, long time and has reinvented itself a few times over in these last decades and is in the process of reinventing itself one more time. And Spencer is in the leading that uh, change process. The company's goal right now is to transform and create the new supply chain of the future. And so that's the topic of his, uh, of his talk. And uh, the question is how can uh, Lee and Fung help its customers navigate the digital transformation and also uh, attend to the needs of the one billion people who are engaged in the supply chain in many of these emerging markets. Spencer has managed every aspect of the company, uh, from dealing with suppliers to dealing with customers to operating across um, multiple countries and continents and merging with companies and integrating acquisitions. And um, the special uh, bond we have with Spencer, Raj already alluded to it earlier, is that he is a, a graduate of our uh, programs. After he got his undergraduate degree from Harvard, he got his MS in accounting uh, from, and MBA from Northeastern, and he is a, a member of the Board of Trustees at Northeastern now. I'm proud to say before he became a trustee, he was a member of our board for the Center for Emerging Markets. <laughs> so Spencer, it's been a long uh, uh, visit in the making. I've been trying to get Spencer to come and speak to us. It's a long way from Hong Kong, but finally it's happened. So thank you so much and welcome. Please join me in welcoming Spencer. Okay, uh, good morning everybody and good morning to the people uh, online. Um, I, I'm very excited to have a chance to speak with everyone here. Uh, there's some hot topics that I'm sure a lot of people want to discuss. I want to try to make it like a fireside chat, uh, although I don't have a sofa and a fireside. Um, I have no presentation, no slides. I'll speak for 10, 15 minutes, and I'd like to just open it up for discussion because I think there's a lot of different points of views that's going around on, the, on these relevant, very relevant topics today. And what I want to do is to share our experience uh, with you. Um, so very quickly, um, a quick uh, personal introduction. I was actually born in Boston, and I support the Patriots. <laughs> That's very important. I just want to make this clear. Um, and, um, but I grew up in Hong Kong, uh, because my family is from Hong Kong. And, uh, but I came back to school in the US, uh, all New England, high school, college, graduate school. I worked at PwC in Boston, got my uh, CPA, and then I went over to uh, Silicon Valley for a few years to uh, start up my own business. That was in the dot-com uh, boom and bust days. Um, afterwards, I went back to my family company, uh, and I've been there ever since. Uh, and, um, so um, a little bit of history about our company, which actually ties to all the relevant topics today of global trade, uh, because our company basically has evolved with global trade for 112 years, and I'm the fourth generation of the company. Um, so the company, Lee and Fung, uh, is based in Hong Kong, headquartered in Hong Kong. We were um, actually a, a Chinese company in Guangzhou, uh, started in 1906. To give you a perspective, 1906 is the Qing Dynasty. So that's how old the company is. Um, my gra my great-grandfather was an English teacher, uh, and he found a um, partner, Mr. Lee, uh, with capital. So he was the sweat equity, and then he started a trading company. And then it just kind of went on for 112 years. Uh, but like uh, Ravi said, you know, we've gone through many major disruptions, World War I, World War II, um, all sorts of stuff. And now we're actually going through um, probably one of the bigger sort of, well, actually, they're all big. Disruptions are always big. We're going through our latest round of disruption right now and to try to stay relevant as a middleman. Uh, the middleman is a dirty word in retail. Everybody wants to get rid of the middleman, uh, but my goal is to make the middleman sexy again. Um, I may or may not succeed, who knows, uh, but we're doing our part uh, to try to create what we call the supply chain of the future. So our company, you know, in the first 50 years actually traded Chinese-made products. Um, so, and this is back in the early 1900s. So you're talking about silk, porcelain, fireworks, very traditional sort of uh, products that you would associate with China. 
But after the World War II and after uh, Chinese, um, the Chinese became communist, we actually moved out of China and into Hong Kong. And that's where my grandfather and my father was educated. And so now the headquarters permanently in Hong Kong ever since that move. That was uh, actually, we started setting up a Hong Kong office in 1937. Um, but as we moved to Hong Kong, uh, China shut its doors and basically we lost our supply, all our supplies. Right, so we had to basically start all over again. We could not access Chinese-made products anymore, so it was zero. Um, at the same time, a lot of immigrants uh, fled China, the communists, and came to Hong Kong and elsewhere. But the ones that went to Hong Kong, were there were lots of industrialists, uh, especially from Shanghai. So a lot of these people restarted their um, business and factories from fresh. Uh, from new in Hong Kong, and we were all refugees. Most people were refugees, basically, in Hong Kong. So that was sort of the first disruption. Now, but that's also when the globalization of production started. Um, really, um, you know, I think it started in Japan, but then quickly moved to Hong Kong, and Hong Kong became a center of um, sort of global uh, supply. Um, you know, based on all these entrepreneurs um, moving away from China and setting up little shops in Hong Kong, and that went on for probably 20 years, uh, 30 years. Um, and then uh, production started moving to um, uh, the rest of Asia. Uh, so to Taiwan, to Korea, to Singapore, uh, and elsewhere. Um, and, in, and then in the last sort of 40 years, production continued to move from country to country to country, chasing lower and lower and lower cost. And the rest is history, is what we have uh, today. Um, you know, so today our company actually sourced from more than 50 countries. So China is only one of 50, uh, but is the largest. China is absolutely the factory of the world uh, because of the you know long history and capability and efficiency, um, and now technology. It's absolutely the most efficient place to produce. Uh, however, um, things in this world is never simple. In the history of mankind. Uh, there's always been conflicts between countries, and it's all about geopolitics, who is dominant, who is not, uh, how to level the playing field. So in our field, um, in my space, um, so we work with about 2,000 retailers around the world, but mostly U.S., and we connect them to about 10,000 suppliers uh, all around the world. So the type of products that we focus on is what you would see in a Kohl's department store. Uh, in fact, that's one of our largest customers. So mainly apparel. Uh, 70, 75 percent apparel, and then the rest is what we call hard goods, uh, general merchandise. So anything that we don't put on our body, you know, that's that's not clothing, that's inside. Let's say a Kohl's uh, department store is called general merchandise. Uh, in the clothing sector, what has happened in the last forty some years is um, a host of trade agreements between countries, global trade agreements. You know, it's come and go in many different forms. And the latest, uh, the latest form, of course, are daily tweets by uh, President Trump, uh, which affects uh, the global trade. But uh, many, many years ago, it was more stable. Um, in 1974, there was something called the Multi-Fiber Agreement, which basically put quotas onto different countries exporting to uh, developed countries, like the US and Europe. So that was, um, that was actually unlevel the playing field uh, between many different countries. It made it more difficult for countries like China, and it made it more easy uh, for countries like Mauritius, Sri Lanka. Uh, every country had a different set of quotas, um, and you know, that was what sort of unbalanced uh, a lot of the geopolitics around the world. Uh, as a result of the multi-fiber agreement, uh, apparel manufacturing started to spread all across the world because it became much more attractive to actually uh, produce in some of these uh, developing countries like Sri Lanka, uh, India, and, and so on. Um, that went on for about um, 40, no, 30 years until 2004. That's when the multi-fiber agreement essentially was uh, abolished and replaced by basically WTO. Um, and China, meanwhile, in the background, since 1978, has been opening up slowly. And you know, one one interesting fact is, you know, our apparel business is all around the world. Our general merchandise business is 80% exposed to China because the quota system actually never 
uh, regulated the uh, general merchandise area. As a result, the um, production just went to wherever it was the most efficient, which happened to be China. Now, if there was no multi-fiber agreement in 1974, a lot of production would have ended up in China, just because of the sheer size, the capacity, and the efficiency. But because of the multi-fiber agreement, everything spread across the world. But meanwhile, China, in the background, was becoming more and more competitive. You know, there's something ironic about when companies or politicians or between countries trying to level the playing field by unleveling, you know, by slapping tariffs and other non-trade barriers to a country is that, you know, it actually made, this is my own personal view, by, by the way, because the China from, uh, the quota from China was so high, it actually made the manufacturers work a lot harder in order to get the same amount of business, in order to grow. So as a result, it actually made them stronger. So when the multi-fiber agreement uh, went away in 2004, and then 2005, China uh, started a quota-free area er era, everything started channeling into China. So from 2005 until last year, in apparel, a lot of things just kind of rushed into China. Um, so that's sort of what happened, you know, sort of in our space. And the hard goods, uh, general merchandise, of course, remains to be in China. Um, but there's one thing that we have learned in the 112 year of history is that nothing ever stays constant in this world. Um, so we take a very long-term view of this world. Um, although we're a public company, and every six months, in Hong Kong is not quarterly, but every six months we get pressure to deliver results. Uh, but I always, um, as a CEO, try to refrain from talking about six months. We're always looking five, 10 years out. If you look at any 10 year, 20 year chunks in the history of the world, something major always you know, uh, happens, right? Geopolitics always unlevels the playing field between countries. So if you take a long term view, uh, in any business, you should never put all your eggs in too few baskets. Uh, but this is exactly what a lot of uh, people in our industry has done in the last two decades since China uh, you know, went into the WTO and since the quota went away. A lot of people channeled more and more production to fewer and fewer countries, namely China and, and, a few, and also within that fewer and fewer factories uh, because it was more efficient, it was cheaper, it showed better results and better margin for the quarter. Um, but as a result, you know, people have been winding up their supply chain very tight. Right, so that any disruption in the supply chain would cause a lot of uh, headaches. So we do have customers today that are hugely exposed to China, despite you know, actually uh, us advising to, to diversify, and now they're actually panicking. One tweet from Mr. Trump causes them a few white hair. Um, but if you look at any business, um, you know, the quarterly rhythm uh, that we have in public markets is not natural for business. Right? A business should just kind of you know, have its strategy and just keep going. Uh, it shouldn't be, you shouldn't jerk your strategy around because of a tweet and because of quarterly earnings, but it happens. Right? CEO tenures are getting shorter and shorter. They're incentivized by stock performance, so they are doing that, but that's a reality. Uh, but what we advise our customers is, you know, in any business, you have to diversify. So you can't put all your eggs in one basket. You shouldn't be all in China. Um, you have to diversify to different countries because different things will happen at different times, whether it's currency, labor unrest, you name it, tariffs, non-trade barriers. There's so many things that could unlevel the playing field at any time, any day, especially in today's world. So what a lot of our customers have done is to respond to Mr. Trump's tweets and changing their strategy because of that. What we're advising against any company to do is you know, can you, I, I just cannot advise any company to change their strategy on a daily, weekly basis because of a tweet. I myself um, don't even talk about, I'm staying out of politics in the time being because uh, it is actually hugely distracting to read about something in the news one day and it just kind of ping pongs from left to right. right? I cannot change my strategy based on uh, short term sort of um, commentary. Um, so what we're doing now is just you know, what we've always done best is to think long term, right? 112 years, I'm the fourth generation. We think five, 10 years out or even longer. So, you know, we always have this North Star of where we think we should be and we just kind of keep pursuing that. Because in the long run, you need a diversified strategy. So for those of you who are in the fund management uh, industry, I'll use an analogy. It's almost like somebody gave you um, $100 million and you invested in 10 stocks, Apple, 
Alibaba, Tencent, Microsoft, and a few big ones. Now, during the good days, your portfolio is going to perform very well. One hiccup from any one of your stocks will basically drag down the, the performance of the entire portfolio. And this is what uh, a lot of companies have actually done for global, with global sourcing. And we've always actually ad, ad, um, advised them that they should be in multiple countries. I think for fund managers, you need to be at least in 30 stocks to, to, um, uh, to uh, what do you call that, to balance out the beta. Uh, but I'm not in that industry. But anyway, so that, this is also why we have kept more than 50 countries of production throughout uh, the last 20 years, despite everyone going to China. In fact, a lot of analysts have been asking us, why don't you just get out of 30 countries, 40 countries, and reduce your cost and just show better numbers? And we resisted. All right, we've kept that 50 uh, countries of production. So with what's happening with trade, the trade war now, um, with the Sino-US relationship, with the tariff being slapped on uh, our Chinese-made products, you have to get out of China. Uh, so we have more than 50 countries of production, uh, ranging from Central America, North America, South America, North Africa, South Africa, uh, Middle East, we're all over the world. So as a result, we now have the largest network in the world, bar none, uh, to move out of China. And in each of these countries, we have anywhere from 20 to 40 years of history with deep relationship with the business community, with the government, with suppliers in those areas. So now, actually, we're very well prepared for what's happening um, um, around the world uh, because of this um, disturbance. <clears throat> Um, but fast forward to today, you know, so today we remain a very diversified company. We're helping a lot of our customers now move out of China. Even categories like general merchandise, which is very, very difficult to move, we're now really pushing that to be moved out. Um, the reason why general merchandise is harder to move is because uh, the capital expenditure for those factories are actually higher. And China is dominant for that. So it's very hard to move out. Uh, but despite that, we are helping uh, companies move out of China. We are talking to multiple governments around uh, the world to help absorb more sort of entrepreneurs to set up new factories in those countries. So all around uh, Southeast Asia, like Vietnam, Bangladesh, Cambodia, Pakistan, India, and also uh, beyond. So hopefully this will actually help diverse, the diversification of uh, global production and alleviate a lot of the short-term pain that we're seeing today and also uh, help people pursue this very long-term diversified strategy. Um, so with that, I'd like to pivot a little bit to the, um, um, that, that was about sort of rethinking the China strategy, but I'd like to pivot a little bit uh, to uh, the topic of my discussion today, which is supply chain of the future. Three years ago, um, we embarked on a journey to create the supply chain of the future um, because we were a very traditional analog company, and we knew the future was somewhere else. So we knew, the, we knew the future was somewhere over there, and it was probably fully digitized. Um, so as a result, we started this journey to transform our company, probably one of the biggest transformations um, that we've attempted, to um, modernize, to speed up, and digitize our operation. First year was exploratory. We really didn't know what we were doing. Second year, we started uh, focusing on a, a few uh, sort of key areas. And now into the third year, we're actually starting to see different shades of gray in that supply chain of the future. Um, we're not there yet. We're, we're, we're still exploring. Uh, but what I can see in that future supply chain is, first of all, it has to be diversified. Right? So in, a, in an analog sense, it has to be diversified. It's not just one country or two. It has to be multiple countries, especially for large companies. Uh, with a lot at stake, you have to diversify. And the second thing is it's, it's kind of like how retail is developing, where people thought, some people thought that Amazon would take over the world. Some people thought that e-commerce in general would take over the world. Uh, all the big e-commerce giants, uh, whether it's Amazon, Alibaba, Tencent, they've now realized that online transaction is only about 20%, and it's kind of peaking. In many different categories, it's peaking. So the bulk of a transaction is still done offline. So what we think in our field of global sourcing is that even though every single process will have a digital element to it, it may not completely replace the analog. It could be sort of like an omni-channel solution, if you will, but nobody knows because we're still exploring. So one area that we're really focusing on is um, digitizing design. Um, if you look at a value chain, a supply chain is very long. There are many, many, many steps. Uh, in the beginning of a value chain is actually an idea. You know, the designer thinking about an idea, looking at the market, sketching uh, something. And then they develop the product. And then they try to source the product from all over the world 
buy the raw material, make the production, do the quality control, then they uh, ship the goods, and then it arrives, let's say, in a port in LA, gets stored in a warehouse, then it gets transported to a store, either sent through e-commerce to a resident, or it'll be sold in the store. So that's our value chain. Uh, but what we try to do is to attack the beginning of the value chain, because um, what I've noticed, at least in my career, is that most problems, if you solve it upstream, uh, the downstream will not have that problem. It's like nipping it in the, in the bud. Um, so one of the biggest problems in our industry, sorry? Yes, totally, but people don't, a lot of people don't see that. Um, so what happened is the biggest, one of the biggest problems in our industry is inventory, right? This is the dirty word in retail, inventory, lockdown. Right? That's the biggest cost to most retailers today. Now, why are people stuck with inventory? Um, this is because supply chains are actually very long. Right? It takes about 50 weeks, about a year, for traditional department stores to ideate, design, produce, and all the way to the store. Right? 52 weeks used to be okay in the old days. In today's world, where all your consumers are on Instagram and changing their taste every other minute, 52 weeks is like eternity. As a result, a lot of people buy the wrong things. They're stuck with the inventory, then they have to mark it down. Now, if we attack everything upstream, that's what we're trying to do, is to shorten that design cycle, which lasts about three to six months. Um, the fastest uh, cycle that we see, actually, even without digitization, is what Inditex does. They see something, and they make a decision within 24 hours, and they produce it, rather than three to six months. So if you can speed up uh, the, um, uh, the upstream process and digitize that, you can actually take care of a lot of downstream problems. Uh, so that's why we started um, in the upstream design part. So now what we have done is we have turned hand sketches and 2D CADs into three-dimensional photorealistic uh, digital assets. Uh, as a result, our customers, um, especially the designers, can make a very quick decisions and iterations of product, is rapid prototyping. It takes three to four hours to make a digital asset. If they give us a comment, it takes 20 minutes, 30 minutes to do the next iteration, and then the third iteration is even faster. So within a day, you can iterate four or five times. Whereas in the past, in the physical world, you have to make a physical sample, probably in China, DHL it to New York, it sits on the desk for a few days, and then they make a comment, and that cycle goes on for a few months. So we've, we've actually uh, been very, um, actually pleasantly surprised by how efficient a 3D digitized design can actually help the entire process. Once you do a good um, 3D uh, rendering of a, let's say, a dress, you can actually automate and use it downstream in multiple steps. You can automate fitting, you can automate the making of a, a pattern, that's the DNA of a product, you can automate color approval, uh, you can actually use the same image on an e-com site. So a lot of stuff that you buy today, not a lot, some, some items that you buy online today, when you see a digital image online, is actually not real. It's actually 3D rendered. Uh, but it's so photorealistic today that you can't even tell. So you can use it basically all the way through. Um, but this is somewhere that we, we started, um, but we still have ways to go. Eventually, we want to digitize partly or completely different process within the supply chain and automate it, and basically become a supply chain data company. Today, we manage 10,000 suppliers. In the future, I hope we can be managing <coughs> gazillion bytes of uh, data. Um, but that's, that's somewhere in the future. Um, and uh, you know what? I think I'm going to stop here, because I, I tend to uh, ramble a lot uh, and go on. Um, why don't I just open it up for a sort of discussion now? Yeah. So uh, actually, excellent story. Wait, wait for the mic. Oh. I can stand up and talk louder. Oh, okay, for the online people. So uh, excellent story, by the way, and just to see the growth since the last time we were there in 2009 and speaking with you has been fantastic. So a couple of things. Could you talk? There's a lot of things that's changed over the last 10 years. Could you talk about the, um, the risks involved around the supply chain that you've had to deal with, specifically around perceived risks, too, of customers? So some of them may not be actually risk, but they're perceived risk. But can you talk a little bit about that? Raw materials um, and also cyber risks. I see. Okay. So let me talk about the analog risk first. Um, you know, the risk in the supply chain is, um, you know, when you look at a product, what determines the makeup and the price of the product, there are probably 20, 30 elements. Is the raw material, is the country of production, is the labor cost in that uh, country, 
electricity, other energy costs, transportation costs, uh, how good an infrastructure is, how supportive the government of those countries are, uh, and how supportive, um, let's say, the receiving country like the US or Europe are of those products. Um, and then there's other sort of non-trade sort of barriers like, uh, you know, uh, elements like currency. So there are many, many risks associated with any supply chain and every type of product has a different supply chain. So, you know, in general, we monitor all of these, um, all of these things. Uh, we also monitor about 400 trade agreements around the world, starting from the WTO to, uh, to individual bilateral uh, agreements uh, within the supply chain. Um, so I, I cannot pinpoint a certain risk, but I would say that what's happening now between U.S. and China is the biggest risk that we have seen since 40 years ago. Because the U.S.-China trade route is the largest in the world, right? So disrupting the largest highway in a city means that you have to go around that highway now. So that's the, that's the biggest risk we see today, and it's uncertain whether this highway will reopen, whether the tolls would be $10, $20, or $100. Right, so I think, you know, I go back to what we're, we're doing, um, we've been doing for decades is diversification. That's the best way that we know um, to uh, diversify the risk. Um, in specific, and more specifically, let's say I'm producing a shirt, a men's shirt. Um, I don't want to be, uh, just have one factory in one country to do that. I want to multi-source and make sure that I have at least two or three countries and multiple suppliers that can do the same shirt. Probably a different price, but I need to have that available. Uh, so in general, that's how we manage risk by having more options. Now, but some products don't have options. There are some products that are so specialized that the options are not there. So the risk would have to be, you know, it's actually super high for those products. Let's say an iPhone. Let's say, um, you know, I think in, in China, you know, we found that the production of microwave is very specialized to a few sort of large players. Um, so in those cases, you have to think of more long-term solutions. Um, because in the short term, there aren't any uh, avail available solutions. Um, so, but that's how we sort of look at risk. Uh, cyber risk is not a big thing for us. We get attacked thousands of times a day, but these are just random sort of small attacks. In the B2B world, in our space, in consumer products, there are no large contracts or anything. So there's nothing really that secretive that we're afraid of. Um, uh, that people want, um, and there's no consumer data. So, you know, cyber risk is a board topic, uh, but it doesn't really affect us so, uh, so much at the moment. Now, but as we become more and more digital, there will be more risk. Yeah, I was just thinking of your supply chain from a customer perspective in terms of your customer risk. But I also see some of the things that you've been... So I, what I was saying is, is uh, not so much risk for you. I mean, in terms of your supply chain feeding the customer base, um, in terms of that potential risk. That's something I was seeing if you're looking at that as well or if your customers are asking you questions regarding that. Sure, sure. But, but one of the analogies that just came to me is I think you're the physical side of Amazon. <laughs> um, I don't know. I've never compared us to Amazon in, in that respect. Um, but for every customer, depending on their product categories uh, and, and split between the product categories, we have different sort of plans. Now, Unfortunately, um, not a lot of our customers have taken our advice in the last 10 years, especially with China you know, coming you know, into the production without quotas. A lot has been seduced by the short-term sort of uh, advantages of being in China. Um, but I can say that you know, one of our large customers uh, diversified out of China four or five years ago under our, uh, our recommendation. And now they're less than 20% penetrated, which is pretty good. Uh, so as the tariff is hitting them now, not only are they less than 20% penetrated, they also have multiple sources they can move to very quickly through our network. Um, so this to us, you know, is the best scenario. But now all the rest of our customers are starting to listen. And, but we're, you know, while they listen in the short term, we want to make sure that they don't go back to where it used to be when Trump is all happy again, right? With, I think one thing that the industry is starting to realizes that this trade war um, could be temporary, could be permanent, but whatever happens, even if there is a deal, our recommendation is that you should move out. Not completely, but you need to diversify. And that's the best strategy. Uh, you just never know what else is gonna happen uh, the year afterwards and the year afterwards. So with or without a trade war, whether there's a deal or not, we're recommending people to diversify. 
Spencer, can you give us some idea of what is the cost penalty of moving out of China for maybe a few sample uh, products? And is any of it coming to North America or to Mexico, or is it still spreading within uh, Asia Pacific? Mexico, there's a tariff too. Um, oh my God. <laughs> Anyways, I won't, I won't even, I won't even, don't get me started. Um, so, um, so every category is different. For general merchandise, usually the best and cheapest, the fastest is China. So moving out of China, usually there's a, an increased cost to it. For apparel, uh, it depends on how difficult and simple the products are. Most developing countries start off with very simple products, like a t-shirt, like a polo shirt, and not like a women's dress. Right, so a lot, of, a lot of those simple products started moving out of China probably 10, 20 years ago. Uh, and the costs are usually cheaper depending on many, uh, you know, mostly it's the minimum wage, right? The minimum wage is usually much lower outside. But having said that, recently because of what's happening to the U.S.-China relationship, everyone is trying to get out of China. So Vietnam is actually a major beneficiary of apparel moving out of China. However, Vietnam is full. It's a small country. China, by the way, is such a large country with a large workforce in, this, in, the, in, the, in the area of production. There is not a single country, nor are there even 10 countries added together to replace China. So there is no country that can replace China, and there is no collection of countries that can replace China. In fact, China cannot be replaced in the next 20 years, unless you have automation. Um, so as a result, you know, things will move up, move out. So Vietnam is full. Inflation, uh, there's inflation, there's wage, uh, there's wage increase. So things are getting more expensive. Now, and this is very dynamic from what, I'm, what, from, from what we're seeing. And then there's currency and other fluctuations. Um, so I would say that a lot of things, if you are forced to move out of a country, let's say China right now, things will be more expensive actually. How much? I don't know, five, ten percent, uh, depending on the product category. I, I can't even, you know, I can't even generalize because every single product category is different. But in the past, it would have been a little bit cheaper to move out of China, but more risk. Now there's more risk, uh, and the price might be higher. Uh, as a result, um, you know, some people may even decide to stay in China despite the twenty-five percent tariffs, and they would just absorb it in multiple ways. Right, the local Chinese government uh, by city are trying to help. The federal government is trying to help. The currency is depreciating. Uh, factories are taking less of a margin. They're just taking a hit uh, because they would rather take a hit than leave the factory empty. Um, so there are multiple ways that people are absorbing this, uh, this tariff. Um, yeah, but so moving out. Um, so there's, there's another thing that's happening that we notice is when American orders move out of China, and usually American orders are larger than the European and other sort of Asian orders, they would go to a country, go to the best factories, and let's say Walmart goes to um, Vietnam to a factory and say, I've got a million pieces of stuff to produce. That factory would have to kick out some of their existing customers. Some are American, a lot of them are European. So a lot of the non-American retailers would have to actually move out of that country or to a lesser capable, um, less capable supply in that country. Um, but so China actually may actually get a huge um, um, increase in non-US orders because the production capacity in the world is sort of limited. Right? You can't just all move out and you know, everything stays the same. Uh, a lot of things actually will move back into China, whether it's the Japanese to European and so on because there's no tariffs. Uh, so this is what you will probably see. Ben? You mentioned, you mentioned that you're in 50 different countries. Anything in Africa in terms of that becoming a more common destination? Yeah, Africa has been a um, sort of a big promise for many years for our industry, but it hasn't really materialized, so it's still small. So we have North Africa, Morocco, Tunisia, Egypt. Then we have uh, sort of Eastern Africa, Ethiopia, Kenya, Lesotho, and then South Africa. So it's scattered all around, but nothing major yet. Um, but we are, this is, Africa is always on our long-term development map. So we believe that one day it will happen, but that one day actually hasn't come yet. We've been, we've been in Africa for probably two decades, but that volume has, we have not been able to increase the volume uh, too much yet. But due to lack of raw material, due to distance, speed, politics, infrastructure, due to many different uh, uh, reasons. 
Hi, um, I just realized that we both worked at PwC when we first graduated, <laughs> but I was a couple years behind you at, in Boston, so it's so great to see you as an alumni. Um, my question to you is that I know you emphasize that diversify, which is very important, and I totally agree for anything, um, but I think that if we, you know, everyone before washing out, moving out of China, I felt like the past 10, 20, 30 years, China developed really good quality um, in terms of producing, but I, you know, I know the cost is important, but I'm wondering how do you measure the quality that the Chinese um, factory have developed, you know, because it takes a few years to train, you know, the Filipinos or Vietnamese to do good products. So um, I just want to, you know, kind of bring that up, how you assess, you know, the cost and benefits on that. Yeah, Thank I you. mean, that's, a very comp that's part of the very complex equation to decide where you produce a piece of goods. In our field, it's mostly manual labor. There's not a lot of automation. As a result, the hand is very important. How dexterous your hand is and how fast you move. Now, one, th one lesson that I learned in the very beginning of my career is when you go to a factory, just close your eyes. So in an apparel factory is sewing machines. Sewing machines have motors. So when you walk into a Chinese factory, it sounds like a Ferrari. <clears throat> if you go to Bangladesh, it's a little bit slower. <clears throat> so that's efficiency. Um, China has absolutely the best efficiency in apparel, bar none. So if you just, if you are, let's say, if you just close your eyes and go all around the world, you will see that Chinese factories are the most sort of efficient. Uh, worksmanship is also the same. So worksmanship is also probably the highest quality in China. So every time you go to a new country, it takes many years, as you say. So now, but then it com cost comes into place, right? If the cost is attractive enough, right, you can either re-engineer your product or, you know, uh, let's say a s accept a slightly lower quality, maybe, you know, increase the fabric quality to make it, make it better. So many different things. Um, so it's not, it depends on each product. So the more manual it is, the more efficient it is in China. The more automated it is, of course it can be anywhere. You know, we are now looking at fully automated factories in the US, right? So eventually, everything will be automated. But apparel has taken a long time. Uh, but we are looking on, you know, for that day that even apparel would be completely uh, automated. Uh, and there are companies trying to do that. And in, the, in, in those instances, you will have a factory outside of China, I'm uh, sorry, outside of Boston, outside of New York, outside of Chicago, just, just serving the metropolitan area. So for example, there's a company in Georgia called um, Software Automation. They're attempting to automate the sewing of t-shirts. If they are successful, they can uh, base themselves all over the US. Uh, they can use US raw material. Trump will be very happy. There'll be employment, but not a lot, because you're talking about software engineers and hardware engineers. There'll be no sewing operators. Um, but it will generate, you know, so they will generate job, a little bit of jobs and also technology in the US. Um, so that's likely what's gonna happen. I'd like to continue on with um, the question about diversification because you had mentioned that you have 50 you know, manufacturers all over the world. And in deciding where you want to go, I mean, cost is always an issue and labor is very inexpensive. But in a lot of the emerging markets, the infrastructure is not there. You know, so while you may save in terms of the manual labor, you know, people today, if they order something online, they want to have it by tomorrow. And so how do you balance? Because transportation there, you know, the roads may not be there in terms of getting the product from wherever you're making it into the country to yeah. the United States or wherever it's going to go. So could you address in terms of how or what things you consider and what are the risks in terms of the pros and cons in terms of how you decide which way you're going to yeah, go? So I listed quite a few of those earlier. So it's the labor costs, it's the energy costs, infrastructure, politics, trade barriers. Um, it's speed. So speed has become a new currency in our uh, field. Um, if you look at Zara, which is Inditex, they have realized the importance of speed since 30 years ago, and they're the best at doing that in scale. Uh, most other retailers did not see that speed was so important, but they're starting to, to see that. So if you put speed into um, the equation, actually China is still the place to be, despite even a 25% tariffs. Um, the reason is, if you look at, let's say, apparel manufacturing, when you manufacture a piece of apparel, you need to buy the fabric, you need to buy the threads, you need to dye the fabric, you need to buy the button, a zipper, 
labels, the whole infrastructure is actually in China. When production moves in apparel, usually it's just the sewing that moves first. That's a very easy thing to move. So you set up a new factory, buy a few sewing machines, hire a couple people and you can sew. But all of the components usually is not in those new countries because those actually requires a lot more capital intensity to actually set up. Usually that lags anywhere from five to even 10 years. So as a result, as production moves, a lot of the raw material actually hasn't moved. It's still gonna be in China. So China will still dominate the production of raw materials for the next 10 years, despite you know, tariffs, because you can't set up these uh, large capital intense uh, factories uh, of let's say making fabrics so quickly. And people won't do that. They wanna see how it goes, and then they will set up that infrastructure. So speed is a huge currency today, and China <sighs> basically wins almost every single time. Now, I described a 50 week journey just now um, of traditional retailers getting from design to uh, the products arriving to the store. Zara gets, there, gets it within low number of weeks or maybe 10, 12 weeks. We're seeing startup now, startup companies all around the world that can actually design a product, bypass the store, ship it e-commerce to the consumer within five days globally. Right, so in those instances, um, China, for example, is still the number one place to be. Um, and also local production for whichever that, wherever that consumer is, is always, is also a very attractive option. So we see companies within China that are producing in China, shipping into Chinese consumers within five days. We see companies in India doing the same thing. We see companies in Turkey doing the same thing. So wherever you have a big production base and a big consumer market, that's actually ripe for these types of businesses. And the future uh, consumers actually expects to see something and get it within days. Now, but this is only very grassroots. There are lots of small companies doing that. They haven't scaled yet. Now, but when they can scale, they would challenge even the Zaras of this world. Actually, when you talk to those people, they would laugh at Zara and say Zara is slow. But imagine what they think of the old traditional department stores, which are still on a 50-week cycle. Um, so this is what we're seeing now. Speed has become a major currency, which are not a lot of people talk about outside the industry. But when you put speed in, China is still the most attractive place to be. Okay, we have time for one, one more. Okay. You talk a lot about Inditex and their model, which it seems somehow you're kind of trying to adapt to it. Uh, but Inditex has a different model than yours because obviously they sell as well. Have you thought as part of your strategy because you have your core competencies and know-how that you have on all the connections to do a little bit of backward integration and start selling yourself as well? Yeah. It, in fact, uh, we do have a, we, we have a sister company that is in retail, uh, but we're focused on uh, China and also the ASEAN countries. So um, that is completely separate from what I run, which is just managing the supply chain. So our company will remain focused on managing the supply chain, and we will leave it to our sister company to actually uh, sell directly to the consumer. So that's happening. Um, but the, um, the Inditex model, uh, no, oh yeah, I wanted to comment on the Inditex model. People have known about Inditex for decades. Most people just didn't even look at it. Oh, fast fashion, they're just another sort of business. It's not my business. In Spain, not my business. Um, so they've known about Intex for, for ages, but it wasn't until probably five years ago that the US retailers started trying to copy that model. However, I have not seen a single successful case to copy Intex. And this is about just organization behavior and change. Right, no organization that has a long history and tens of thousands of people doing something one way can shift so quickly to another way. Right, the Inditex model is not a secret. Everyone knows it. You can buy a book, you can read an MBA case, you can hire people from Inditex to tell you exactly how it works. But not a single company have been successful in copying it. Just because it's a cultural thing, it's an organization thing. Right, it's not just about learning how they do it. It's actually very difficult to change the mentality and culture of your organization to, to do it that way. Um, but, you know, anyways, people are still trying. It's not easy, but I think what I'm telling people is don't even try to copy Inditex. Look at what the startups are doing, because those are your future competitors. Inditex is your competitor today, but by the time you catch up with Inditex, they would be somewhere else, first of all, and the startups would have scaled. By that time, you have to catch up again. So might as well go, let's say, skip a step 
and aspire to work as fast as these startups and try to find out how to scale. Let's say, you know, can Walmart work on a five-day supply chain? Right? Maybe, maybe not, but they will have to figure it out. It's a completely different system. And that's what we're trying to do in that future supply chain is speed and digitization and flexibility and diversification. Yeah. Thank you, Spencer. Thank you so much for giving us a glimpse into your world. Thank you. Thank you, Thank everyone. You. Thank you.